Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone uh, who's joining us. We, uh, we're now going to jump in and start our webinar today, Transforming Performance Testing for Agile Teams uh, with Service Virtualization. Today's presenters, um, we have myself, Dan Giordano, Product Marketing Manager um, for the Ready uh, and API suite over here, and then Michael Hawley, who's our SE, our Solutions Engineer, uh, helping out as well with that ready side. Um, so he's going to have a great uh, demo for us at the end of this uh, and we'll go through some use cases and actually um, get our hands dirty and not just look at some slides. Um, this will be recorded. Um, it's being recorded now. We'll send this out. Um, we should have it within two days. Uh, we'll send it out to everyone. So if you do uh, have to leave halfway through, uh, you'll definitely get the full recording. Please uh, add your questions to the Q&A box. Uh, the Q&A box we'll be able to handle uh, rather than uh, actually chatting. Um, but feel free, we'll answer them at the end of the uh, webinar today. If anything pertains to exactly what we're going through in the demo, um, we'll bring that up and get that answered as well. Um, and then we have a few polls today as well. So be sure to uh, take our poll at the end of the uh, webinar. All right, so Smart Bear, who are we real quick? Uh, a nice little introduction. We're a Boston-based company. Uh, we have seven offices globally that focus on creating solutions for developer, testing, and operations teams uh, to help them instill quality throughout the entire software delivery lifecycle. We were founded in 2009 and continue to add products to our portfolio, including uh, kind of promoting and, and working on popular open source tools like SOAP UI and Swagger. And then our newest additions to the family um, with cross-browser testing uh, a couple uh, years ago at this point, and now hip test as well. Um, which is only a, a few months old in our actual, uh, in the Smart Bear family. We make tools throughout the entire software delivery lifecycle, um, but I think today we're going to be definitely honing in on two specific areas, um, and that's on the back end side with service virtualization um, and load testing as well. Um, but we do have everything from UI to API tools, um, from the development, testing, and operations teams um, with solutions like. Alert site and QA complete, tying those all together. Just a real quick interruption, um, a soft ad for us. This is uh, our second annual Smart Bear user conference. Um, you can find more at the address listed here, smartbear.com slash connect hyphen 2018. Um, but this was an amazing experience last year. Uh, we had awesome guest speakers and customers coming in. Uh, and sharing their years of testing knowledge and experience with us, um, not only with our products, but just with working um, in development teams. Um, and this year we'll be right downtown in Boston um, at the Copley Marriott. So you'll definitely not wanna miss this. Join, buy tickets for now uh, and sign up. We'll be uh, putting that on uh, right before Halloween weekend uh, in late October. All right, so today's agenda, uh, we're gonna have a poll we have some challenges of agile performance testing. We'll just kind of talk about um, what teams are working with now um, and how fast uh, agile development teams are trying to move. Um, and then we'll kind of talk about what actually is service virtualization um, if you're not familiar with it from the performance side. Um, and then we'll talk about some use cases of load testing with virtual, virtualized assets. All right, so we'll start here uh, with kind of <clears throat> the promise of a new software delivery lifecycle. This is us transitioning out of waterfall, um, out of delivering value um, at a long cadence. So here um, in our diagram, we kind of have the design, build, test, and implementation uh, portions of the SDLC. And then we're, we're kind of getting one unit of value at the end of that. Um, and it's taking four sprints, maybe let's say just two months there, um, two weeks each. Um, but that's a long time to deliver value. Agile has helped us kind of shrink that time down um, to start delivering value at the end of each sprint, um, which is great. And it's definitely pushed the way we, we thought. And that has ultimately led us to like a DevOps approach um, where you're just actually taking agile processes and agile uh, feedback and iteration loops um, and actually bringing them to a technical Im implementation. So we're kind of continuously um, getting value out there um, without uh, stopping or without having this cadence that Waterfall uh, grew up with. Uh, and there isn't less testing happening here um, in Agile DevOps. The phase is simply broken down, it's sped up, and it's spread out. So not, uh, we're not focused just on the test phase. We have testing happening in the design phase and the build phase. Um, throughout the entire SDLC, um, we're instilling that quality there. 
Um, but because the speed is um, increased, there's a tremendous amount of uh, pressure on testing teams to actually keep up. Um, because you can see here, we're not just moving uh, kind of the development and testing and design patterns left, we're actually moving testing left as well. Um, so within the development area, you're trying to do more unit testing, more integration testing, more end-to-end -end and load testing here without actually incurring the quality team, without incurring the testing. Um, but going to get done with each commit to Git or uh, every time you actually integrate into your repo, um, we're going to run through all of these. Um, and as we'll see, we'll be able to do that because uh, of our, our virtualized assets and be able to push that testing left. We also have synthetic monitoring here, uh, kind of pushing out. Uh, over the entire phase. We see uh, as we move to Agile with performance testing, it is great to have synthetic monitoring on your entire pipeline. So uh, with AlertSight, that's our um, actually performance monitoring tool. You can monitor API or web, uh, web application and actually do it pre-production. Uh, so you can install that agent on your box, constantly monitor, go out, make sure that performance um, is sound throughout the development lifecycle. Um, and because kind of the speed is all coming at us so fast, as you can see, the last thing here is load test. Um, and that causes us to get uh, load testing pushed out. Because software development has delays and tight deadlines, um, and we move even in an agile pace, that, that load testing is still kind of happening last without um, a solution like virtualization, uh, it's going to get pushed out. They're just always going to happen. Or we have a slip in quality, right? Unavailable systems and data, we're kind of doing incomplete load testing um, in the testing phase without actually allowing uh, that production-like system um, to get built out. And you can see here uh, kind of the meme on the right. Uh, this is what we see a lot. We kind of leave um, our performance testing, our performance um, uh, to the performance monitoring team, right? Once it's in production, it's like, okay, now that's great. We have a monitor on it. We'll see if the, if our load, or we'll see if performance degrades over time. Um, but it's better to do that obviously before with a load testing tool. And we need to mirror production environments for best results. Um, I think that's one of the main challenges. We'll go through quickly some challenges of load testing right after this, but this is the essence of what we're trying to build here. Um, you see it happen with different industries here. We have a wind tunnel. Um, you can think the same thing with airplanes. Um, we can see the performance here um, of actual like the aerodynamic nature of this car without it having maybe an engine. Um, so the engine's not there. Uh, the same way we might not have an API in our application. Um, we're able to actually still measure the performance um, and see what's happening. Some of the innate challenges of load testing uh, that are there unavailable internal and third party services? Uh, what happens if they're just not available? If our underlying APIs, um, maybe we have scheduling conflicts, uh, maybe they're not available um, on the weekdays and we're only able to really load test them um, on the weekends or a nightly schedule, uh, unavailable systems will always have a place, um, especially in today's new architecture where it's very service oriented. Um, we have tons of microservices. There are a lot of distributed systems um, and that means that everyone's trying to use them at all times. Data configuration and management, another huge problem uh, with load testing and kind of all testing in general um, is getting those testable configurable responses from the third party APIs. Uh, if you're using a, a bank API, if you're using a telecommunications API, uh, it's really difficult to mimic those real world uh, scenarios of let's say maybe um, you're using your banking API and you're going under a tunnel and you lose um, actual service. That service is not going to cut out immediately. It's kind of going to wane over time. So you're going to be able to pass uh, less packets of data through um, the system in that short amount of time. So how does your system react to that? Does it try to burst everything through or does it just simply um, degrade nicely? And then costs. Um, this is going to be something uh, that I think service virtualization really solves, um, but it's the cost of actually hitting third party services with something like a load or even an end to end test at scale, uh, it's wildly expensive. Some of these security APIs, some of these, um, again, banking APIs, they can cost something in the area of, uh, let's just say two cents per call. Um, if you're gonna throw 100,000 uh, virtual users through that system, um, that's gonna get really costly really quick.
So now let's talk about service virtualization and how we kind of overcome some of these challenges. Service virtualization is a method to emulate the behavior of any of your specific APIs or systems um, in modular based applications. So again, think microservices, think service oriented architectures, uh, service virtualization can really help us there. It enables us to work in parallel. Um, so right from let's say an API definition um, or its specification like Swagger, um, we can stand a service up we can start testing against it, we can start building against it, but it allows those teams to work in parallel. Um, it also allows us to control, again, um, the actual data that's going through this service. Um, you'll see Michael will go through, we'll be able to actually play with the entire API as if we control it ourselves. Um, and then it reduced testing costs, right? Uh, service V is a fixed kind of cost in the license uh, model, and it can replicate and mirror uh, any types of, of RESTful, SOAP, JMS, JDBC, and you not have to actually pay for usage on that side, not be limited by uh, rate limits either. Some of the benefits of servers of virtualization uh, are obviously faster de development cycles. Um, we're gonna just reduce the time in that testing phase um, because the testing phase is going to squeeze down into the development phase. We're actually gonna be able to do performance testing, we're gonna be able to do end-to-end -end testing um, during the development phase without having to throw it over the wall um, and have our application be 100% ready uh, to run those load tests. It's also gonna increase test coverage. Uh, one of the beautiful things about service virtualization is edge case testing. Um, we can really, really take control of that API. Um, we can force uh, bad scenarios through it. We can give ourselves error states that might not be possible um, when testing an actual production service that we don't own ourselves. Um, and lastly, a faster time to resolution. Um, in general, service virtualization allows us to get our feedback back rapidly. Um, we no longer have to wait for things. We no longer um, have to throw it over the wall. Um, we can actually just get feedback um, in seconds against a, a mirror-like system. Here's an example of a typical staging process for a development team. Um, if you could imagine on the left, uh, we have our components, right? Component A, component B, component C. Uh, they're gonna all build up the system D. Uh, let's say it's a, uh, we might have a payment processor, um, we might have a database that stores the user's information, and then we might have a, a mapping system um, that helps out with our application. All three of those um, allow our system um, D to actually um, be running. For here, we'll have two to four weeks, everybody working on their own components. We'll not be able to do really any testing here except at the unit level um, since everyone's working completely separately. Um, maybe after two to four weeks, uh, we'll begin a integration testing um, in a typical manner. So we'll start connecting some of these components together. Maybe some of the components um, will take longer than others. Maybe some of the components are actually third party and we don't control them. Um, but in this case, we're not actually able to integrate all of them. Um, two weeks goes by, so now we're at about a month and a half. Um, we have our systems are coming together a little nicely now. Um, we have two out of three components up and running, and maybe component B um, actually has most of the development work done, um, but doesn't have a live database behind it. And we're still kind of crunched here in an aspect of we're not actually testing a production-like environment. Component B here um, is still not in the green, um, and it's still not a full, complete system. So we're skipping out on quality, um, and we're also waiting a long time to actually run this. And finally, once we're in production, we have all of our systems, we'd be able to functionally monitor, we'd be able to run transaction monitors, but by then, um, it might be too late. There might be bugs um, that are released to customers, and by the time we're catching bugs at that point, um, it's expensive uh, when we could have bought them in the design or maybe the development phase. With service virtualization, uh, testing can happen immediately. Uh, we can virtualize all these assets. So we actually have our system ready to go. We can run end to end. Uh, we can run user ac acceptance tests. We can run load tests all against the system um, that is actually virtualized. And in this case, we're, we're just cutting off three weeks of work, uh, almost half the time that this project would have taken, uh, which is a huge win uh, for any development project in general. Um, if you can cut down kind of that time and a half, uh, that's great. And service virtualization is one of those ways where distributed teams can now um, work as if the system is whole um, during weeks two to four um, when they normally wouldn't see that. And 
Virtualization is uh, similar to mocking, right? It's kind of mocking on steroids. And we want to talk a little bit about kind of the differences between the mocking um, and virtualization. Mocks are, are static in nature. Um, they're a little bit hard to create. Uh, you do need a little bit of a scripting experience. If you're going to create a mock uh, that actually is a little bit dynamic, at that point, you're basically building out a fake service um, inside your real service that you're going to have to build out um, on your own again. Uh, we see teams go through that time and time again, um, where for a big software project, they'll take four to six weeks to mock out um, actual services um, so they can start building the rest of their application. Um, that's four to six weeks consistently over enterprise companies um, when they can actually virtualize that entire API in just a few hours. It's also really hard to share mocks. Um, you'll see that virtualized assets are really easy to share um, with a tool like Service V Pro. Uh, when we have Vert Server, um, which can stand up inside your firewall, inside your own um, infrastructure or in the cloud and host these virtual assets um, so all of your team can access them. Um, and then also the stateless nature. Um, there's just something about the dynamic nature of um, actual virtualization virtualized assets um, that is a huge advantage to uh, unit testing to integration testing to performance testing but the fact that you'll have real data uh, consistently outputting in the api um, makes it a, a huge uh, boost over mocking and even stubbing as well um, service v pro this is how we kind of break down what service v pro does for us we can create the mock uh, we can configure the mock uh, and then we can actually deploy that. Um, so we'll create this service um, in a couple different ways. And we're gonna go through this in a demo, but we'll record traffic between two systems. Uh, we have a neat internal browser that will allow us to do that. We can also import a Swagger definition, a WSDL, a Waddle. Um, you can actually stand up that, that spec inside um, Service V Pro. And within minutes, you'll have a live kind of a breathing API, if you will, um, without coding. And then you can also build RESTful services. Um, you can prototype uh, with our wizard and kind of build them from scratch. Uh, once those virtualized assets are actually created, um, you can configure them. So we'll see where we can hook up a data source like an Excel file or a CSV um, or an actual database. Um, and then you can do things like customize um, some of the network aspects. So um, let's say network latency, server capacity, but all these really difficult um, to replicate scenarios. And then deploy. Um, this is actually a, a huge competitive advantage for us. We're trying to democratize the power of virtualization. Um, we've seen kind of the, the market go uh, towards this phase where virtualization is, is very high on the architectural level. Um, you see a lot of managers working with it, a lot of um, enterprise architects worrying about the virtualized assets. Um, we're trying to make them easy to use, easy to deploy, easy to configure, so that every developer feels empowered, every tester feels empowered um, to create a virtualized asset, um, develop against it, test against it. Um, you can deploy them locally uh, in minutes. Um, you can also deploy them in the cloud uh, with Vert Server in minutes as well. Um, so without actually having uh, to work with anybody else, you can stand these APIs up, but you can also share them out. Um, and that's actually gonna take us um, right to uh, our demo right now, which we'll see some of this, um, and we'll see load testing uh, against those uh, virtualized assets. So Michael, you want to take it away? Absolutely. All right, welcome everyone. Thanks once again for joining us and, and thank you, Dan, for the intro introduction and uh, setting the scene here. Uh, my name is Mike Hawley. I'm a solutions engineer over here at SmartBear covering the API side of uh, SmartBear's product portfolio, including the Ready API suite of tools and, and Swagger Hub uh, for design of these uh, REST uh, APIs. So first, let's set the stage a little bit more. Let's talk about what our application, our, our use case is here, uh, and then talk about the, the individual tooling, how we can solve these problems here. So what we are testing. Uh, let's let's say that I have a weather location application that relies on two individual services. Uh, the first being Google Maps. This is a great uh, service here. You know, Google has is very consistent um, in their in their um, 
you know, they're, they're offering uh, with these, these APIs. And it really allows us to get, you know, information, make these calls, get back some info about um, these, these locations uh, that we're going to be searching for within uh, the application that we're building. And the other uh, service that we're relying on, this third-party transaction uh, that we're making uh, as a part of this, is the Open Weather Map uh, API. And this allows us to use the information um, that we get back from, from Google Maps, the geolocation information, latitude, longitude, latitude, um, to get back the, the uh, most up-to-date weather information um, of that, that location there. All right. So this is uh, a great little uh, example and some of the, the, the struggles that we're trying to solve with Service V um, is when I load test this interaction, this integration with my application, with my code and my front end, right? This is the core functionality of my service. So it's really important that I need to be able to first load test this application and have it um, be able to handle that, that kind of traffic that I expect in the production environment. But I also don't want to pay an arm and a leg to Google and to the people who are maintaining the open uh, weather map API for access to that service, especially during load testing. All right, so it's really important to be able to virtualize parts of these services here, um, whether the, it's in the entirety of the, the Google Maps API or just parts of it um, based on what kind of uh, searches that we can make. And I want to have that localized virtual asset of the Google Maps API that I can freely load test at any single time. I don't have to worry about availability. I don't have to worry about paying Google Maps out of pocket um, for these long and strenuous load tests on my system here while still being able to do that, that uh, functional testing, integration testing, and uh, have that full end-to-end -end or, or DevOps process um, before this gets moved to production. All right, so that, that'll set the scene for us and um, bring us into the main topic, which is uh, Service V Pro. Now, I wanna be virtualizing the Google Maps API at the end of the day. Uh, I don't have to keep paying uh, Google Maps uh, for their, their services as long as I can help it. So what I can do is start from a, a few different locations. So I can use a uh, a, a, a this manual process. I can start from scratch. I can flesh out uh, the resource that we're going to be using uh, using this this empty rest um, template here. So create the um, the resource and then flesh out manually these responses that I would expect from the the Google Maps API. Um, and while this is this is a good way to get get started and, and maybe a good way to uh, f start familiarizing yourself with uh, Service V as a nice, you know, sample project. It's not exactly what I'm looking for, and, and the problem that I'm trying to solve with with uh, Service V and this particular scenario here. What I would feel is more powerful and more, um, especially more important, is being able to reach out directly to. Google Maps. I want to be able to route to that live endpoint. I want to be able to use Service V as uh, a kind of like a proxy. Um, there we go. Google Maps, GoogleAPIs.com. Be able to route to that live endpoint. Uh, use my client to point some tests at it um, for my, uh, you know, through a functional testing tool like SOAP UI Pro to make those calls and record those transactions, or even something like our, my, our browser here um, to, to be able to get back the information that we want um, by pointing it to uh, Service View Pro, and then have that virtual instance with the transactions that are really important to us um, that we want to eventually be load testing. So let's, let's go over that. So I'm going to stand up uh, Service V. It's pointed towards this local endpoint here on port 8080. And I've already built out this functionality here within SOAP UI Pro. So I've got a couple of calls here uh, to Google Maps and uh, Open Weather Map. And I even have this data-driven uh, testing scenario here so I can start making some of these calls. 
All right. The differences, uh, the one thing I have to take note of is I'm still pointing to that live endpoint. So instead of this uh, HTTPS maps, Google APIs, com, I just want to be pointing this towards my virtual service here on port 8080. There we go. So at this point, I can start uh, running this test case here. The context is already there for a service fee to start recording these transactions. And then all I need to do is start running this functional test. It'll make all the calls that I need it to uh, and then record those transactions in service fee. All right, so we can already see that this is starting to get fleshed out. Those uh, responses are coming back to us. Perfect. All right, so I'll stop recording for now. And in fact, if I don't need any more transactions to be recorded, I can just completely shut this off. And now let's take a look at what we got back. So for my first response here, this is exactly what I would have gotten back from Google Maps uh, in the first place. But instead of reaching out to that live service, I do not need it anymore. And uh, if I stand this up and, and run this test again, it will give me the exact same results. It'll pass our test here. So we can already start to see some of the power behind this route and record feature within Service V Pro. I won't need to reach out to uh, Google Maps anymore, at least for this, this uh, test environment that we've created here, because I already have the context and the transactions that I need to eventually load test uh, the service. All right. In addition to the, the actual data from Google Maps, I can make additional changes to this. I can, I can even um, manipulate some of this JSON that we're getting back. All right. And then keep making calls to the service and then we'll have um, whatever I need or whatever I've added to this response here. So we have really full control uh, over this entire service here, the responses, right? And, you know, Dan mentioned this before, but the, the what we do differently than a traditional um, mocking uh, solution is that we can create this stateful context uh, as opposed to these, these static responses that we'd have to script out within uh, our, our code here for, for that mock. And what I mean by that is under this dispatch style in the middle here, right, uh, we have this parameter uh, option here. All right. If we go into what's actually being, uh, uh, what's what we've actually recorded here. One moment. So not only did we record the transactions themselves, so for, for information about Boston or San Francisco or LA, we also recorded the context from our request to give us back that Boston response. And really all it is, is a conditional statement searching for the API key and the Boston address within our uh, query string, right? And then if those two are you know, given to us, we will always give back that Boston response. So you can write these, these really quick rules or can record them as a part of that route and record option and be able to continually create this dynamic context, this dynamic virtual instance of your uh, Google Maps API or any other service that you want to be eventually load testing. All right, so this is the essence of, um, you know, not only recording these transactions, but creating the context by which uh, we dispatch the appropriate responses based on the, the queries that we're making. So now that we have this API, what can we do with it? Well, the first thing that we can do, and Dan mentioned this a little bit earlier, is we can start changing the behavior of this service that we've created. We can uh, increase latency and, and restrict bandwidth. We can also uh, simulate these downed um, services, right? We can, we can uh, instead of having that 200 okay with uh, the, the information, we can 
simulate a service going down, giving us back a, a 400, 500, what, what have you, uh, along with some error messages. And we can even uh, set a duration of this. It doesn't have to be permanently. Um, we, we can time this um, and, and continue our, our load testing or, or our functional testing against the service in its various states. All right. Uh, another fun little um, manipulation of this data that we're getting back is through our data sources, right? So we can, instead of having this, um, this static uh, response that we've created, we can create a little bit more context or, or a little bit more of a dynamic nature to these responses using that data source option. And this can come from, let's say, a, a, an Excel file. Right? We're pulling in data from a physical Excel file that we can use to, to feed uh, data into our responses. We can use a SQL query, again, to, to feed that data in, connect those um, what's coming back from our table and our SQL query to our responses. Or uh, a little bit easier, we can use uh, some data generation or some manual creation of data to feed that that in. So uh, we have a number of these options using this this data generator. So we can create, um, you know, randomly generated user information, uh, emails, user IDs, cities, states, phone numbers, things like that. All right, and be able to start creating a little bit more of a dynamic nature to this uh, test environment and something a little bit more lifelike. Uh, than a traditional mocking solution. All right, so these are this is some of the power uh, that you can get out of of Service V Pro, um, being able to create this lifelike and and robust uh, API from either a live uh, application that we're going to be uh, needing as a part of a, a, one of our dependencies for our application, uh, or as a way to create a, a prototype or, or a part of a feature um, for our, our final application here. All right, so, so with that uh, Service V Pro introduction, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, the, the other half of, or the other part of the context of our, our presentation today, and that's through through load testing. Now, we're always gonna tell you that it's, it's going to be expensive to uh, have that additional overhead. And it, it's absolutely true. I, Google Maps has, has a number of tiers um, with that, that you quickly go through um, the limit to the number of transactions that you can make before they start charging you more and more uh, for, the, for those transactions. And we will quickly get through those uh, with load testing. Now, because we have this uh, service that we've created in Service V Pro that'll reduce, drastically reduce costs and while we'll still being able to, to have a consistent way of, of testing um, what the final product is, is going to be looking like and, and how we can integrate with these third-party services. All right, so let's go back to SOAP UI Pro for just a moment here and go through um, what we're going to be eventually uh, putting into Load UI to start performing this test uh, at scale. All right, so let's let's re uh, reposition ourselves, recenter ourselves. Um, so we've created this this data driven test, this functional test within SOAP UI Pro. Um, it's the same kind of of integrations. We want to be able to take this this real data, uh, something like our, our users would would search for various cities and, and states, um, and be able to feed that into our application, and then be able to search for not only the uh, locational data, the, the uh, latitude and longitude of these locations, but also the weather, um, what, what's currently going on and how the weather is looking. Um, uh, today, it's, it's particularly hot in Boston, so that's something we would uh, be getting back from this kind of, of application that we're building. All right. We can run this um, once within SOAP UI Pro, or if we can run it, but basically this is just a manual test case, this one-off uh, use of uh, these, these APIs that are available to us. And we really want to be testing the limits of our application. So uh, with three clicks, right click, we're going to create a load test, hit OK, and that'll bring us directly into uh, Load UI Pro. So it's a really powerful way of being able to create these performance tests with 
the services that we're already uh, functionally testing within SOAP UI Pro, as well as these services um, that we're uh, leveraging uh, that we create in Service V Pro. And I just want to do a quick double check here to make sure we're not load testing on Google Maps because that will charge me a lot of money, uh, like I said before, and it looks like we're, we're good to go for now. Awesome. So now that we've created this, we want to be able to increase um, the, the, the value and increase and certainly increase the, the traffic of, of what we've uh, created here and, and start doing some lightweight performance testing. So this is, this is all what it comes down to. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run this uh, very briefly for, for about 30 seconds. And really, instead of those charges that I'm going to be making, all I'm really load testing, and this is uh, you know much more lightweight, uh, is that Open Weather Maps uh, API. All right, so we're still able to get back realistic response times to see uh, how uh, our our application is doing. It seems to be going pretty well so far. Excellent. Now, without going into to too much deal detail about Load UI Pro. We ran our performance tests. We're able to get back some really nice um, metrics, really detailed or as, as broad as we want, create these custom graphs and, and tables uh, within that statistics tab, right? We're able to monitor the actual hardware that's executing these tests, that's making these calls behind the scenes. So we're able to get back the, the CPU usage and memory usage. Um, and especially if there is a spike in response times, maybe some bad performance, we'd be able to more accurately take a look, especially when things are a little bit more isolated uh, in these, these virtual environments and these test environments. Uh, we're able to see how the, the hardware um, responds in kind, see if any upgrades need to be uh, made and then these tests need to be run, uh, ran once again. Another particularly powerful part of Load UI Pro is the way we distribute uh, these, these performance tests. So if we're looking to simulate you know, thousands, 10,000s uh, of users, a single machine, generally speaking, is, is not really going to cut it. So we want to be able to distribute uh, using what we call uh, little agent applications that you can download free from our website, install, uh, configure on the machines that you want to be distributing to, and then connect to those via that host and port, and then be able to click and drag these test scenarios that you've created, these performance scenarios, uh, onto the agent and then run them in a distributed fashion. All right, so it's a, it's a really nice way of leveraging your physical uh, infrastructure and environment to distribute on a dedicated server, multiple servers, your neighbor's uh, machines. Um, and we also have this nice um, integration out of the box with Amazon EC2, so you can leverage their architecture um, or, you know, integrate continually with your, uh, your uh, deployment onto to AWS and have everything uh, nice and, and uh, centralized in that cloud environment there. So we have this nice uh, Amazon EC2 uh, integration uh, for uh, performance testing in the cloud, right? And at the end of the day, we want to continually accelerate the uh, DevOps, you know, build, develop, test, and then finally um, deploy these applications. So we want to be able to fit everything under a single pipeline. And for this initial test environment and accelerating things uh, a little bit more further, um, we have these command line utilities um, for all the tools within the Ready API platform. So for something like a, a Jenkins pipeline, uh, we'd be able to have uh, start with our native plugin to Service V Pro, start the virtual um, service here through the command line headlessly, run our functional tests, our performance tests against these uh, using, using a command line script with this test runner uh, utility here out of the box, and be able to say this is the uh, project file or these are the tests that we've already created within Ready API, have Jenkins execute them automatically or um, when uh, a new feature or application or a part of our application gets merged uh, into our existing code base. All right. 
And so, and then we, we execute these tests, we run uh, various reports in, in CSV, XML, uh, raw formats or uh, a JUnit style report to be more con uh, readily consumed by that automation tool, like, like again, like Jenkins, for example. Um, and then finally tear down these uh, virtual services that we've created. All right, so we have this nice DevOps approach um, and, and a nice uh, CI CD approach to building our applications, virtualizing assets, saving time and money, and then having that continuous throughput from um, creation, implementation, test, and deployment to that uh, live service there. All right. The, the last thing I want to talk about, um, just to, to bring us back to Service V just for a moment here, um, is the ability to deploy these services uh, onto a, a sister tool uh, that we uh, call Vert Server. So everything I've described so far and, and the entirety of this project and, and this uh, use case that I've created within Ready API, this is all local within my machine, my, my environment here. So if your team wanted to be able to test, integrate with these applications, prototype some data um, by, by calling uh, the API that we've created uh, under some, some front end code, like a, some JavaScript and, and render out some data and prototype a front end, they wouldn't be able to do that with just Service V. They wouldn't be able to reach out to those services uh, if it's just on Service V. So what we can do with Vert Server, and Vert Server is a lightweight application uh, that we can run on any kind of machine, server, what have you, um, and then just deploy these services and start making calls against them. Right. So these are the services that are available, and. We even have a, a version of that, that Google Maps API that we've created. So anyone uh, in my network, so various colleagues, Dan would be able to start calling this application, these services, uh, once I start having them available um, in this deployed environment here. All right, so, so we see a lot of this, um, especially for uh, DevOps or, or management teams, really utilize uh, Service V Pro or, and, and Vert Server for both uh, designing these applications and then deploying them to a remote uh, fashion. So this is, again, fits very nicely into this uh, automated DevOps pipeline and have a little bit more flexibility um, on, on how to ac access these services, uh, especially when uh, architecture these days is a little bit more dynamic. All right, so let's, let's, um, let's bring it back Let's, uh, let's summarize a little bit and then we can close with some, some questions because I can see some good ones uh, coming in uh, through Q&A. So for our scenario that we've created, we have a, a weather application and we rely on two third-party services, Google Maps and the Open Weather API. All right, Google Maps I know has uh, a limit on the number of transactions that I can make against it before it either shuts me out completely from uh, making, getting back information, or if I uh, create an API key, it will start charging me for uh, making calls to this service here. All right, so because of that, because I wanna save that overhead and I want a little bit more control and I wanna be able to start testing integrations without worrying about um, money, first of all, uh, as well as consistency of these services. Uh, I create a virtual instance of the Google Maps API by routing traffic through Service V to Google Maps and then recorded these uh, transactions so I can have this localized and consistent version of uh, the service that we've created. We can then fit this within our functional tests within SOAP UI and our load tests within Load UI Pro. So we're able to um, keep hitting, making calls against this, test the integrations with Google Maps and Open Weather Map, uh, and all within uh, Load UI Pro, get back um, these uh, metrics of our performance tests, distribute, monitor our servers, uh, and then again, fit all of these pieces that we created within a greater DevOps pipeline um, that we eventually want to be using as a part of our. Um, 
production uh, pipeline uh, as well. Right? Um, and then now that we've created this service, we have full access and full control over it. So we can change this behavior. We can bring in um, outside information uh, within our data source or randomly generate some values to make a little bit more of this uh, dynamic API. And we can deploy these services to be accessed remotely uh, using another tool in Vert Server. So we can use Service V to um, design these APIs, and then we can allow uh, outside access um, from our, our different team members, uh, developers, what have you, uh, using Vert Server once it's deployed and up and running. All right. So with that being said, let's get to some questions. Uh, we have some good questions. So let's start um, with how do we point the virtual service to the app configuration? Uh, I think he's, so actually this is something we didn't really talk about uh, too much today, but we talked mostly in the manner of APIs here. Mm -hmm. um, all these APIs obviously can, can be the back end of, of your application, right? So where you're making that API call in your JavaScript, um, in your actual, um, whatever language you're using, mm -hmm. you can replace that with your local host. Um, and that's kind of how you're going to slide in uh, that virtual service into your full application. You'll be able to test against that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then on the other hand, uh, you create all these virtual assets and eventually you want to be testing or monitoring that production environment, or at least build it out in a way that, you know, push these services that we create to production. Um, so then you would just switch back that local endpoint to that live endpoint um, for those full integration. Is there a limit on the number of virtual users uh, that can be utilized um, in load testing, uh, like actually hitting a virtual service? So that, that question has a few parts to it, um, Chris. Uh, so, but it's a, it's a great question and one we get pretty often. Um, so, let's see. so the limit, to answer the first part, so the limit uh, to the number of virtual users uh, is, is first defined by the, the license for LoadUI Pro. It's how many uh, concurrent users that we can generate um, to, to, to really increase the, the traffic uh, against these services. And generally, you wouldn't be uh, load testing these, these virtual services, but it's good within the context of this particular use case here when there are other parts of your application uh, that you want to be testing in tandem while virtualizing um, you know, third party uh, services here. Um, and then to answer your, your, the second half of your question is you basically want the, the resources available um, in, in, in a similar way that we can use this uh, or, or hit um, that service that would be already created, right? You would create that, that virtual service and you would need the hardware resources to handle that, that kind of load, right? So whatever virtual service is uh, you're running from, from a machine, from a server, uh, it's it deployed on, on vert server in, in a, a dedicated server environment, right? You would um, be able to, to basically test those um, based on those uh, resources and whatever's being allocated to the, the Java machine. Uh, to actually um, build and, and, and run uh, these services that we've created. All right. We mentioned Jenkins. Uh, can this also be configured to work with Maven, Chef, uh, Team City, uh, any, any of the other CI tools, CI servers, build servers? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so uh, Maven's a little bit different because you use a POM file. Uh, uses XML for all its dependencies, bring those in. And we do have uh, various jars that we can um, bring in um, and we've, we've created those. So we certainly uh, love our, our you know, Maven users and we have a number of these, these jars that we can call um, and our documentation really highlights that. Um, we, uh, so I mentioned Jenkins because it, it's a pretty common one and we, we just recently uh, developed a native uh, plugin for Jenkins, uh, so you can call these tests and these services um, from, from that uh, plugin marketplace. You can download those and, and start uh, testing your Ready API projects a little bit more easily. And then for uh, Chef, Team City, Bamboo, what have you, um, it would be the same as Jenkins, uh, for example, without using that plugin. So we 
create the um, bat Windows batch script or, or shell script for you Unix or Linux users um, to be used as a build step to call these tests uh, from those automation tools or, and, and they, they interact with the command line. So you can even run this from like a Windows task scheduler or your own uh, command line interface. All right, question. In this use case, when you simulate the call to uh, Google Maps and do it as a virtual service, you are eliminating the network factor. Very, very true. Um, as you're testing locally, mm -hmm. are you able to simulate network latency and network impact? Yes, absolutely. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier and I'm more than happy to go over it again. Um, but one of the, the great features about Service V is that we are able to uh, simulate that that network latency and, and traffic and NC services uh, and even the, the hardware specs to to an extent as well. We have a couple of um, actual license questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one more actually from Chris. Uh, can you explain the difference between an agent and kind of a vert server? Um, if I wanted to deploy a virtual service to an isolated server, uh, would I have to use vert server? I believe in that case uh, you would or you would have the license of Service V uh, installed on that machine, on that server. Yeah. Um, but Vert Server is <clears throat> kind of a server applet that allows you to deploy any of these different services to that particular server. So let's say you had um, a cloud, uh, a public cloud you wanted access to, and you had an isolated server mm -hmm. and deployment uh, and local deployment, you could have your local Service V um, actual uh, product and then you'd have two vert servers one on the isolated and then one on the cloud yeah and then yeah. you'd be able to share throughout that exactly exactly yes yes mm -hmm. um so so think of of ready api service v as just the design tool um and then you can and that would be on your your local machine or, or in the cloud um and then you would um you know just host for its server wherever you needed it to be uh actually i actually have a question about secure pro you want to take like 15, 20 seconds to just show Secure Pro. Tell us all about it. Yeah, absolutely. So, Real so quick. as a as a part of this um, continuous testing, test early or test more often uh, initiative that we're really trying to to move forward um, with with all of our tools. Uh, that's just part of the, the smart bear mantra. Um, we have Service V Pro available now, bundled with uh, SOAP UI Pro, so we can test the functionality of our application and then in uh, a very quickly we can spin up these uh, security tests of those services. Um, so the idea being, right, we can uh, take these existing API calls and be able to start creating uh, scans against those for XPath injections, SQL injections, cross-site scripts, these common types of attacks against um, these, these APIs by malicious users. Now, keep in mind that, that Secure Pro isn't going to be uh, replacing uh, any existing uh, security tools that you already like that are dedicated, but it's a nice way of, of testing earlier, testing more often, and en enabling security testing as part of your uh, DevOps process. All right, a question. Uh, I use Load Runner to load test my application with thousands of users. Um, with your product, do I still use Load Runner or your is your product a replacement of the load testing tool? Um, I'd say we could be a replacement here in this case, um, and that would be the Load UI Pro um, actual product. Mm -hmm. But Service V Pro can certainly stand up, and you can run performance tests, you can run end to end tests um, against that Service V Pro virtualized asset with any tool. Um, so it's agnostic in that nature. Um, so I, I think that should answer your question. You can certainly use Load Runner. We'd love to tell you why uh, Load UI Pro is, is a better choice for actually uh, load testing your APIs, um, but you can continue using that while hitting um, an actual virtualized service from Service V Pro. Um, and I think the last one is actually, we'll take two minutes to broach this subject as well, okay. but <clears throat> uh, we generate stubs from a contract and use it in unit tests on the consumer side. Okay. Um, they're able to detect changes early on, uh, how do you do this in an open API, ready API workflow? Um, so I think if we just want to take a minute and a half to, to explain uh, virtualizing something like a Swagger spec um, and standing that up into a virtualized asset and being able to hit that live. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really cool topic. It's something that we really enjoy because um, we you know, are, are great uh, uh, 
proponents and, and great supporters of the, the open API um, initiative. So, so we can take these uh, open API specs um, that we're, we're stubbing out. We want to be able to, to spin up these, uh, these stubs that we've created um, from our code gen tool um, and then start testing them uh, more effectively. So that's, that's one way we could do that. Um, the alternative way is to uh, create this virtual uh, service from that definition and then be able to start uh, stubbing out um, the 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 behavior that way but uh, like i've shown you we've created more context um, using that that parameter option these different dispatch options uh, so instead of just uh, mocking this service here we can virtualize this service um, and have more of that lifelike uh, functionality there and i'm just gonna quickly there we go so we can take a, a swagger definition or an op api open API definition, bring this into Service View Pro, and then we'll be able to see the context of those requests and responses as defined by our definition file, uh, and then be able to create the skeleton and then flesh out the behavior uh, very quickly and very easily. Yeah, and this is definitely something that we uh, are constantly trying to develop and work on, um, certainly uh, with us having kind of swagger in-house. Um, where it's very close to our heart, being able to take mm -hmm. that contract um, between business owners, non-technical testers, uh, anybody on the design side um, who's building these APIs and, and being able to virtualize them easily, um, being able that entire workflow between um, the API world and the design and that spec um, is certain, something we're certainly working on. Um, and if you haven't checked it out, you can go check out like swaggerhub.com. Uh, or actually, no, now it's at swagger.io. Um, so on the Swagger site, you can check out Swagger Hub. Uh, it's our kind of cloud um, collaboration platform for building those Swagger specs, um, and it'll integrate real easily uh, with Ready API. Exactly. So that puts us at the top of the hour right now. I think that's going to do it for us today. Mm -hmm. um, really appreciate everyone taking their time out today um, and coming by. Thank you, Michael, um, for that awesome demo. And we will be sending this uh, recording out in a couple of days. Uh, so enjoy, everybody. Have a good weekend. Have a good day, night, um, whatever time zone you're in. Yep. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye.